He's given what he needs. He's been offered the chance to be healed. But his pride is getting in the way because it didn't go the way he expected it to go. Welcome to Uncaged Bible Study. We hope our name gives it away as we are looking to unleash God's word in its entirety from beginning to end and unlock the power within the pages of scripture. We aim to restore the authority of God's word in a world that has lost its understanding of doctrinal truths, as well as shed a light on how from the first page to the last page, the Bible is pointing us towards Messiah, our Savior, Jesus. So we hope you enjoy the Bible study today. And if you did, follow us or share the podcast to help us spread the word around the globe. And if you leave us a five-star review, that's a great way to let us know that you say amen and are impacted by what you've heard. So thank you for joining us on this journey. And in the words of Charles Spurgeon, the Bible is like a caged lion. It does not need to be defended. It simply needs to be let out of its cage. Let's unlock the cage together. So last, last week, we we read through 2 Kings chapter 3, which is really Elisha has taken over for Elijah. And Elisha has, he performed a couple of miracles to show that he had taken over Elijah's position as Elijah was carried off into heaven in front of other prophets. But chapter 3 was the time where he really performed his duty in front of the king. Uh, and we got to witness what that was like. Now, in chapter 4 and chapter 5, even though this is the book of Second Kings, the focus is almost entirely on Elisha or the, the people that Elisha interacts with. So the kings are really not mentioned. Um, and that's really because Kings, the book of Kings is written from the point of view of the prophets. And when the prophets were moving, that's what was recorded. And so the prophets were doing something awesome. And Elisha is... Is recorded in, in doing the many miracles that he did after taking over for Elijah. And a lot of them are covered in this next these next two chapters. So that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to look into that. So let's start off. Chapter 4, verse 1. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So what's happening is this woman whose husband has died cannot pay her debts. Um, and they're God-fearing family. And she's wondering, crying out to Elijah, what's what's going on? We we love God. We're actually, we're God-fearing. We're not following the pagan rituals that the rest of Israel is is doing. And why am I in this position where my sons are being taken away from me? Because if you were poor and you couldn't pay your debt, then often what would happen is the person you owed the debt to could take some of your family members as slaves to work off the debt. Now, according to Levitical law, if you were taking members of Israel, they couldn't be treated like a common slave. And after seven years in the year of Jubilee, they would have to be, or the year of Jubilee, they would have to be released from or at least offered the release from slavery. They could choose to stay with their master if they wanted to, especially if they were being treated well and built a nice life there. But they had to be offered freedom under the Levitical law. So this is what's happening. Her sons are being taken as slaves from a creditor because she cannot afford to pay. And she's asking Elijah, why is this happening? So Elijah said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. So then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. So Elijah's saying, what what on earth do you you have of any value in your home? And she says, we have some oil, but just a little. So Elijah says, here's here's the plan. Go take empty vessels jars, empty jars that are made for oil from all your neighbors. Anyone that will give you anything, an empty jar, ask them for it and collect it. And not just a few, collect as many as you possibly can. Go throughout the neighborhood and collect as many as you can. 
It says, when, and when you have, have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and let her sons who, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt. You and your sons live on the rest. So this is what happened. She does, she follows Elisha's instructions, and her sons go and collect empty jars from all the neighbors, as many as they can, and they bring them to their mother. And what she's doing is taking the one jar, a little bit of oil that she had, and pouring it into all of these empty vessels. And her jar of oil never goes away. It just stays full as she keeps emptying and filling all of these other empty jars. And she ends up with a boatload of jars that are full of oil from her one canister, which doesn't make sense. Exactly. It is a miracle. And it's very similar to a miracle that Elijah performed with a widow when God told him to go to her. And she only had a little bit of flour and a little jar of oil. And Elijah asked her to take care of him and give him bread and, and water. And she said, this is, I only have one meal left. This is, I have a little bit of flour, a little bit of oil. My son are going to make it, eat it, and then starve to death because unless crops grow, this is our last meal. But they were sustained as they took care of Elijah until rain came. So this is very similar, and Elisha is really showing that he's taking over the place of Elijah, and he's performing a similar miracle, but to a different degree. It also sounds a lot like Jesus turning water into wine. He took empty vessels, filled them with water, and then all of a sudden there was a giant abundance. And so what this woman was able to do was sell this precious oil and sell enough to pay off her debt so her sons don't go into slavery, and then also enough to live on, which is pretty great. And then we get a new a new story in verse 8. And so it just it kind of goes like this over the next, especially this chapter. It's like miracle after miracle with Elisha. Now, it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem when there was a, no, a notable woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was, as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, Look, now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please let us make a small upper room on the wall and let us put a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lamp stand. So it will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. So Elijah basically stops in and eats food at this place as he's traveling a lot. And this woman says, this is a godly man. We should take care of him. And she becomes really hospitable. And they turn the roof of their house into another room specifically set aside for him. That's pretty amazing. This is really just good character. Uh, and it happened one day that he came there and he turned into the upper room to lay down there. So he takes them up on their offer and he stays with them as he's traveling through this area. Then he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite woman. When he called her, she stood before him and he said to him, say now to her, look, you have been concerned for us with all this care. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. So he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, actually, she has no son and her husband is old. So she doesn't ask for anything. But Elijah is so aware of how kind and hospitable she's been. He's wondering, what can he do for her? And so Gehazi, his servant, says, even though the woman didn't ask for anything, he says she has no child. So he he said, call her. When he had called her, she stood in the doorway and he said, about this time uh, next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, uh, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant, which is an odd thing to say for someone who you know is a man of God and you've been taken care of because of the ministry that you've seen him do. And she says, don't lie to me. Uh, but the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come, of which Elisha had told her. And the child grew. Now it happened one day that he went out to his father to the reapers. And he said to his father, my head, my head. 
So the child is born to the woman that she didn't ask for, but she's thankful to have. And now he's complaining of a headache. So he said to his servant, carry him to his mother. And we had taken him and brought him to his mother. He sat on her knees till noon and then died. So I, just before we move on, just a map, put yourself in her shoes for a minute. She wasn't willing to ask for something. She was very humble and didn't think this was something she was ever going to have. And she didn't even consider asking for it. And then she did get a son by the grace of God through the prophet Elijah asking for her. And she's so thankful and grateful to have this. And then suddenly he dies at a very young age. And so she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God. So she lays him in Elijah's bed, shut the door upon him and went out. Then she called her husband and said, please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and come back. And so he said, why are you going to him? It is neither the new moon or the Sabbath. And she said, it is well. So she goes out, she lays her son down in Elijah's bed that she prepared for him, goes out to her husband, asks for a donkey so that she can go and chase down Elijah. And her husband says, what are you doing? It's not the new moon or the Sabbath. What he's really saying is, it's not one of the festivals. Why are you going to the holy man? I don't understand what you're doing. And she doesn't even answer. She just says, it's fine, and goes. Um, So I understand, because I'm married, that it works like that sometimes. You, you don't get answers to your questions, especially if there's incredible focus. And she knew nothing was going to stop her. She didn't even want to have a conversation, which that's something I haven't experienced as a married man, that she didn't want to have a conversation, but she didn't. She was only focused on one thing, her son. So then she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, drive and go forward. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. So she sends her servant with the donkey ahead of her and says, don't even slow down for me. You just go. I will catch up. And so she departed and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. So it was when the man of God saw her afar off that he said to his servant Gehazi, look, the Shunammite woman, please run now to meet her and say to her, it is well with you. Is Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your child? And she answered, it is well. So Elisha sees her, sends his servant while she's still afar off. And his servant says, are you okay? And she says, yep, fine. But she's not even willing to have a conversation with the servant of Elisha. She has one mission, to get to Elisha. Nothing is going to stop her. Nothing is going to slow her down. Now, when she came to the man of God at the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to push her away. But the man of God said, let her alone, for her soul is in deep distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. That must be weird for Elisha, because he's usually so in tune with what's going on for him to be in a position where he knows that she needs to tell him something, and God has hidden it from him. So she said, did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? So I didn't even ask for this. Why would you do this to me? And he said to Gehazi, get yourself ready and take my staff in your hand and be on your way. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not answer him, but lay my staff on the face of the child. So Elijah sends his servant Gehazi out to go to the boy and to lay his, his staff on the boy to take care of him. And he even gives him the same instructions to act like the woman is acting. Don't stop. Don't have a conversation. Just get there. Help her. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Do not mess with moms. She said, uh, absolutely not. I, this, this to me, I think of, you know, the, the moments when a When a mom grabs the kid by the ear and is like, come, you get over here. And that's what she's acting with Elijah. She's like, you just, you come with me. You're in trouble, young man. You have work to do. Now Gehazi went on ahead of them and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Therefore, he went back to meet him and told him, saying, the child is not awakened. When Elisha came into the house, there was the child lying dead on his bed, which, by the way, Not the child laying on the child's bed, the child dead lying on Elisha's bed, which had to be a sight for him. He went in, therefore, shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. 
and he went up and lay on the child and put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands, and he stretched himself out on the child, and the flesh of the child became warm. <clears throat> he returned and walked back and forth in the house and again went up and stretched himself out on him. Then the child sneezed seven times. And the child opened his eyes, and he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite woman. So he called her, and when she came in, he said, Pick up your son. So she went in, fell at his feet, and bowed to the ground, and she picked up her son and went out. Elisha is doing some pretty intense stuff, and stuff that ultimately points to Jesus. This sounds a whole lot like some of the stuff Jesus did, like raising Jairus' daughter or Lazarus. But it doesn't stop. He's got more to do. Elisha also apparently really likes to feed people, as you'll see in the next couple of miracles. Elisha returned to Gilgal, and there was a famine in the land. Now the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said to his servant, Put on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. So one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered it from, uh, gathered from it a lapful of wild gourds and came and sliced them into the pot of stew, though they did not know what they were. Then they served it to the men to eat. Now it happened as they were eating the stew, they cried out and said, Man of God, there is death in this pot, and they could not eat it. So let's just reiterate this story. Some men are gathered together out in the field, right? And one of them, or a few of them, a handful of them, decide to go out and gather food to feed everyone. But these guys apparently have no idea what they're doing because they gather stuff without even knowing what they're putting in the pot. Would you go to that restaurant if the ingredients aren't listed and you don't know what's in there? Uh, and then someone, we don't know what happens, right? We don't know if if someone gets sick, if someone dies, or if someone just happens to be sitting there who should have been the cook, recognizes what's in the pot as they're eating it. And he says, oh, this is not good. This is poison. And someone yells out, there's death in this pot. There's poison here. We're going to die if we eat this. So Elijah said, Then bring some flour. And he put it into the pot and said, Serve it to the people that they may eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. I don't know about you, but that sounds like magic flour. That doesn't exist. What does exist is God's power through Elijah. He uses flour as a mechanism, but he saves everyone from the poison. So death is at their door. And he prevents death through flour, which makes bread. This, again, points to Jesus as the conqueror of death later on. Verse 42, Then a man came from Baal Shalisha and bought the man of God bread of the first fruits, twenty loaves of barley bread and newly ripened grain in his knapsack. And he said, Give it to the people that they may eat. So Elisha's brought a bunch of bread, and Elisha says, Give it to the people. But his servant said, what shall I set before this 100 men? He said again, give it to the people that they may eat, for thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. So what's really going on? 20 loaves of barley bread were brought to Elisha. Elisha says, give it, give it to the 100 men. And uh, his servant is basically like, that's not going to feed 100 guys. What are you talking about? And Elisha says, give it to them and there will be some left over. That should sound very familiar for anyone who is at our service on Saturday. Jesus feed the 5,000. So Jesus does way bigger miracle than Elijah. But they eat some and they should have some left over. So he set it before them. They ate and had some left over according to the word of the Lord. Now, chapter 5 gets really interesting. And there's probably more application in, in chapter 5. Now, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man. In the eyes of his master, because of him, by the because because by him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. Now, just pause there for a second, because Syria was typically an enemy of Israel. But it says here that Naaman was a great and honorable man, and by him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. So, again, God is the God of all nations. Israel has been chosen as the chosen people to present God to the world. 
and they still have a whole lot of duty left, um, which we get insight into in Romans 9 through 11, but that's not what tonight's about. But God had used this man for Assyria. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. So there's an Israelite girl who basically says, uh, if you were by the man of God, by this prophet in Israel, he could heal you from your leprosy, Naaman. Naaman tells the king of Syria, and the king of Syria sends a bunch of gold and goods to the king of Israel, thinking that somehow the king of Israel has any sway over Elisha, <laughs> which is, it's funny how the neighboring countries think. The, the pagan leadership the kings had a lot of sway over the priests and the prophets of their kingdom. In Israel, particularly the northern kingdom of Israel, which never seemed to follow God and never had a good king, the prophets were always working against the king, always telling him what he was doing wrong. So really, not a bright idea, but we'll see how it works out. So when it happened, when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man? to me to heal him of his leprosy. Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So the king realizes this is, this is bad news. This guy has sent me gifts. I don't want war to break out because I can't, I can't fulfill his command. He's, he's weeping. He's, he's in mourning. He's torn his clothes. And he, he's saying, I, I, what is this? Are you looking for a fight? I can't do this. So, it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Elisha hears about this, and he says, Hey, don't worry. Send the guy to me. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. So here's where it gets really fun. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan in the Jordan River, seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. So this soldier from a neighboring army has come to Israel to seek healing, coming to the king. The king obviously can't do it, but Elisha says, send him to me. I'll take care of him. As he's standing outside of Elisha's door, Elisha doesn't go to meet him. He just sends out a servant, and he tells his servant to tell the man, who is a, he's a mighty warrior. He's called a man of valor in God's word. You know how many Gentiles are called a man of valor in the Old Testament? Naaman, he's the only one. And Elisha just sends a messenger out to him. He says, go, go clean yourself in the Jordan River. Go clean yourself seven times. And you will be clean. So he's offered a promise of getting well. Verse 11, But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal his, the leprosy. So he's given what he needs. He's been offered the chance to be healed. But his pride is getting in the way because it didn't go the way he expected it to go. He wants the respect and honor of the prophet to come out and handle it himself. And he says, are not the Abana and the, and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage, saying, what's so special about the Jordan River? Why can't I wash myself in our rivers? They're cleaner. The Jordan's muddy. He, he's, he's, going, he's going to miss out on a blessing because of his own pride and feeling disrespected by people. Now, I think of this frequently when... Now, this isn't the end of the story. It doesn't end here. But I do think of this 
when I hear people say that they don't want to go into a church because they've been hurt by other Christians or they've been hurt by the church before. And I think to myself, you are, you feel disrespected by people, so you're turning your back on God. God is offering you salvation, but you're not willing to go before him because of your own pride and how people treated you. But thankfully, verse 13 happens. <clears throat> and his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? So his buddy says to him, hey, you're missing the point. You came here to get cured of, of leprosy, and he offered you the chance to do it. Now, if he had told you to go do something that you would have considered honorable, would you not have jumped at the chance? And what's more important, how you look or actually getting the cure that you desire? And so because he had wise counsel, he's willing to make a good decision. And that's where a lot of us can stand in the gap for people who have chosen to turn their backs on God. If we can be the person who points them in the right direction and helps them see their lack of wisdom, then maybe we can do what this guy did for Naman. So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God and all his aides and came and stood before him, and he said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. Now, he had to humble himself, and he had to do something that he thought was a little bit humiliating. He had to wash himself in the foreigner's waters, in the muddy water of the Jordan, instead of going back to the clean places or even meet with the prophet himself. This makes me think. Now, if Elisha had gone out and waved his hand over him and the leprosy had gone away, he would have attributed that to Elisha and the power that Elisha had. But he had to go do something and humiliate himself a little bit, be humbled. And when he experienced healing at the hand of God, he knew that it was from God specifically. And now he realized there is no God in all the earth except for the God of Israel, except for Yahweh. So he says, Therefore, please take a gift from me. So he's trying to offer a gift to Elisha. But Elisha says, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So Elisha is not willing to take a gift because Elisha is not the one who did it. God is. So Naaman said, then, if not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer either offer either burnt offerings or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. He's basically saying, these things I would have had, I would have used to offer sacrifice to the pagan gods. I'm not going to do that, so will you at least let me give this to your servant? Yet in this thing, may the Lord pardon your servant when my master goes into the temple of Rimmon to worship there. And he leans on my hand and I bow down in the temple of Rimmon. When I bow down in the temple of Rimmon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. And he said, go in peace. So he departed from him a short distance. So what he's saying is, I recognize that the only God is Yahweh. However, in my duty to the king, I am going to be asked to be stand, to stand with him and go into the temple. And apparently the king must have some ailments because he requires the hand of Naman to bow down in their temple. And so he's saying, when I am forced to help my king, as part of my civic duty, when he goes into his temple, know that I'm not bowing down to Rimmon, even though the king is. I'm just helping my king in doing what I've been asked to do for my civic duty. Will you allow me forgiveness when this happens? And Elisha says, yeah, go in peace. Because he understands, God understands your heart. And if your heart is in worshiping him, he's happy. Verse 20. But Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, the man of God, said, Look, my master has spared Naaman and this, this Syrian while not receiving from his hands what he brought. But as the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. So Gehazi, a servant of Elisha, sees that money was to be made in this ordeal and is upset that it wasn't. So he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take matters into my own hands. 
So Gehazi pursued Naaman. When Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master has sent me saying, so now he's going to lie. My master Elisha has sent me saying, Indeed, just now two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. So Naaman said, Please take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in his two bags with two changes of garments. And he handed them two of his servants, and he carried them ahead of him. When he came to the citadel, he took them from their hand and stored them away in the house. Then he let the men go, and they departed. Now he went in and stood before his master Elisha and said to him, Where did you go, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant did not go anywhere. So Gehazi chased after him, realizing he offered him so much, he didn't take it. I'm going to take advantage of this. And he runs after Naaman, and he tells him this wild tale about young men who need help, and Elisha sent him out there to get the help from Naaman since he already offered a gift anyway. And Naaman gives him what he asks for because he's thankful for the healing. Gehazi takes it, goes back to Elijah. Elisha, knowing what happened, knowing that Gehazi was gone, says, where have you been? And Gehazi says, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I was here the whole time. This is like the penguins in Madagascar. You didn't see anything. So he said to him, Did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money and to receive clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep, oxen, male and female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naman shall cling to you and your descendants forever as he went out from his presence leprous as white as snow so the the leprosy that naman was healed of was now put onto gehazi because of his failure to follow through now i do find this interesting from someone who performed so many of so many similar miracles that jesus performs greater he performs a resurrection jesus performs several and the ultimate resurrection he feeds a hundred men with 20 loaves of bread jesus feeds five thousand with five and so on, that Elisha had a servant who was loyal to him until money got a hold of his heart. And then out of greed, he turned his back on Elisha and then was judged and punished for it. If that doesn't parallel a future event, what does? So, I mean, all of that's interesting. But I would say that in terms of application, the point that I would take from this the most uh, would be Naman. He nearly let his pride get in the way of God's blessing and God's grace. He he wanted it to be something more tangible or that offered him a higher place of honor. He didn't want to humble himself to get healed. And uh, I would be weary of that after reading this. Am I willing to humble myself before God and allow him to do his work, put him on the throne rather than me, me needing to be on the throne, me needing to be exalted? Um, does my pride get in the way? And I think that's the best application, or at least the the clearest application point I got from this text. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for these chapters. Thank you for the story of Elisha and for what it ultimately points to. Thank you for his willingness to serve you uh, and to be willing to put you front and center and not take the credit for healing. The fact that he didn't go out and meet Naaman and wave his hand in front of him and say, you're not healed, means that he wasn't the star of the show. He made you the star of the show because you are. You are the creator and author of life, and you are the healer. Help us to be humble. Help us to take wise counsel when it's given to us, and help us to be wise counsel for others who need it. In Jesus' name, amen.